mind coming up the front, I'll just uh, have a, just ask you a couple of questions if I could, just by way of introduction. I've known Ross for quite a number of years now, um, and we're just in fact neighbours, just uh, about a minute or two from each other. Um, now, Ross, first of all, perhaps you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about your um, your your educational background uh, for starters. Then you could tell us a little bit about, about your work, perhaps. Yes, yeah, so in my background, I'm a uh, uh, clinical biochemist, biochemist, neuropharmacologist. So. Bi pretty big, pretty big words. Biochemical pharmacology. So I teach uh, <coughs> pharmacology in the Faculty of Medicine, University of New South Wales, and uh, currently I'm also the head of research. Or so, getting back to your education, like you, you went to primary school and then high school and then you did a degree and then you did something else and then you've done a PhD and so we can call you doctor. So you've done a, you've done a quite. I mean, you're still a young man, and uh, obviously you, you focus a lot of your energy toward education. That's an important part of your life, obviously. And that's led you into this field of, of uh, in terms of your vocation now. Yeah, I mean, my, my interest really, and we, I don't know whether I want to take up too much time talking about my background so much, but uh, um, I've always had an interest, particularly in terms of the central nervous system, which is why neuropharmacology and neurochemistry have been my real focus area. Um, but what is fascinating over the last couple of years is when looking particularly at dementias, and uh, looking at what was actually producing the degenerative processes that are associated with things like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, but particularly Alzheimer's, is that, uh, and in fact, uh, even developed uh, a small what we call combination therapy to stop that sort of degenerative process. We've got a patent on that now. But it became clear that there was no point in uh, targeting somebody once the dementia was already there, particularly for a degenerative dementia. Okay. So you had to look back further as to what was actually causing it. And when you start stepping back further, you see the risk factors, and I won't have time to show you, but the risk factors for heart disease are exactly the same for actually for, for, for dementia, with a couple of exceptions. And so you're looking at processes that essentially you have control over now as to whether or not you have risk factors for later on. So, okay, so it's yeah. created a much broader focus on okay. that. So besides the work you do at the University of New South Wales in lecturing medical students, you're also involved in the, th the place called the Australasian Research Institute, which you're the executive director of, I understand, That's is that right? Yeah. And so this is where you get to actually do some research yourself and direct other people in research That's our programs. Yeah. And this is what excites me because uh, last time I bumped into Ross when we were going for our morning exercise, he was telling me about how some of the things I could do, some simple lifestyle choices I could make to improve my health and to reduce the risk of getting some of these problems he's, he's, uh, he's very, very interested in. So we'll hand over to you now, Ross, and uh, I'll be uh, listening very carefully about what I might do to improve my lifestyle. Fantastic. So Good what thing. do I do from here? Okay. That's it. Okay, now I might stand over this side if that's okay. There's no... Uh Nobody behind me that way. I can point to the screen, which means I can focus you up there if I need to. Um, now, I have to admit that uh, I thought that I was coming to talk to probably about 10 or 15 people. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a good audience. Obviously, you've got a, a great group organising these things. But this really is true. And a little bit about the Australasian Research Institute. We're on the, uh, we're on the campus of the Sydney Adventist Hospital. Uh, so those of you that know from the North Shore there, that's the sand. And uh, we're very excited about the sort of direction that we're, we're heading in. You can see that our motto is discovering the science of wellness. And uh, while a lot of people are doing a lot of other things, one of the things that we think people have lost, we do a lot of medicine around treating people with disease. But we really need to stop people from even getting disease. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of these diseases, you take decades to get there. But the same process is going on, decades. And sad to say, in a room like this, although you all look pretty healthy, but uh, if this were a typical uh, group in, in, in Australia, I would say that 85% of you are tracking down towards things like uh, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and uh, a significant proportion even towards dementia. But uh, you don't have to be that way because the processes are the same. So we're interested in what it means to be well. And I'm going to give you some principles as opposed to uh, standing up as a, as a dietitian or or somebody of that nature who's telling you what you need to do, I'll put in a few principles and you should be able to, hopefully by the end, decide for yourself what's good and what's bad. Now in a fairly short presentation like this, and normally I give four or five lectures uh, to cover the topics reasonably adequately, uh, so there's going to be a lot of things that are missed out, but I'm hoping that we can at least hit the principles. So what are the major causes of human disease, or in fact human death, uh, here in Australia, the Australians? Uh, these are uh, from 2009, I'll show you next later, but most people think of things like accidents and infections and 
you know, some sort of inherited disorder, exposure maybe, you get lost out in the bush, or various toxins industrialised, or you swallow some poisons, etc. But in fact, they make up less than a third, generally. What makes up most of it is what I call poor <coughs> biological maintenance. It's essentially what you're doing to your body and how your body is being maintained. And this is both in the area of exercise and nutrition, but I could put psychological there too. And I'll, we won't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I'm happy to take questions. But uh, that will make up over two-thirds of what actually caused people disease and actually kill people here in Australia. So if we have a look at the main ones, we've got things like uh, heart disease. We've all heard of cardiovascular disease, having uh, you know, a heart attack, if you like. And also stroke, so the vascular disease are actually affecting things in both of those areas, both those organs. Cancer, particularly prostate, breast, colon and lung. Then we've got the dementias, chronic lower respiratory diseases. This is mostly associated with people who smoke. Uh, and then diabetes. Uh, a lot of the same causes as these two, and then a, uh, a few. <coughs> they can, you can see these two up here, and particularly, in fact, these top, in fact, all of them. These all have what we call, uh, greater than 95% of the disease that kill Australians have a strong link to age and lifestyle choices. Now, all of these, you've got greater risk as you get older. All of them have a link to what's called oxidative stress. Has anybody heard of oxidative stress? Okay, got a couple of people. Has, everybody, has anybody heard of free radicals? Yes. Free radicals? Most people have heard of free radicals. Now, <clears throat> for the chemists amongst you, I know that there are some slight differences in terms of the definition, but uh, generally speaking, when we talk about free radicals, free radicals cause oxidative stress. I'm going to explain that shortly. But this is what's really driving the degenerative changes that happen here. I'm going to explain that a little bit later on. So keep that in mind. That's an important principle. So what happens as we age? Oxidative stress accelerates the ageing process. Mm -hmm. Now, just to give you an orientation, I could have put guys in here, but I was trying to sort of... Scare us on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, I've done both. And uh, it's funny, I did have one uh, young lady up the front saying, don't show me what I'm going to look like when I get old. Um, but I look, think she looks pretty great for Sesame in any case. But uh, what you can see here, and just think about what's going on, what we see here is a change in which organ? Skin. The skin. We're seeing what the change is associated with the skin, maybe a little bit in relation to the skeleton, uh, the bone. <coughs> but essentially we see degenerative change in the skin. Do you think it's only happening in the skin? No. no. It's happening essentially in every other organ. Can you increase ageing of the skin? Yes. You can? Yes. What's the best way of doing it? Yeah, Stand out in the sun, enjoy yourself. In fact, in Africa where I worked for three years, um, it was interesting that the ladies used to try and uh, um, uh, lighten up their skin. So they would put hydrogen peroxide. Oh well. And for those of you that are, are natural blondes, you'll know what I mean. And so it, of course, bleached their skin, but what it's doing is actually, that's a very strong pro-oxidant and will actually cause a lot of free radical damage to the skin. So ultimately, you see these ladies who generally have beautiful skin, but then once they've used it for a couple of years, it starts to get pitted, the pores get bigger. It's just mm -hmm. like putting... Uh, you know, I mean, you're putting something very toxic on this thing. But it's certainly an ageing process. Now, what's causing that? Now, we say oxygen and other free radicals, but we're just going to call it oxidative stress. Accumulate tissue damage, resulting in structural degeneration. So it's not quite as good. It's degenerating. This is not a regenerative process, is it? Degenerative. Functional decline. The skin is not quite as elastic, doesn't stretch as much, doesn't even keep in the heat as much, and a few other things as well and age-related diseases. Now, the age-related diseases, yes, you can get some associated with the skin, but it's associated with the other organs. So we've got this oxidative damage, causing damage to the tissue, and uh, causing age-related diseases. You can bring none on a lot quicker, really. And I can show you how, so keep, keep looking, and if you want to increase the degenerative process in different parts of your body, you should have a good handle on how to do it by the time I finish. So reducing oxidative stress, free radical damage, will keep our cells healthy and therefore our body will be healthy. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I want you to think just very quickly. Here we are. We're made up of what? Broadly speaking, what are we made up of? Water. water. Okay, water. And what makes up, uh, if I say, okay, I'm made up of skin, heart, liver, lung, kidney, all the rest of the organs, you know, my nervous system. You know, all of those are made up of what? Cells. They're all made up of cells. Now, inside the cell, 
is what? What's the thing that has all the information that keeps the cell working? The, DNA. the nucleus, the DNA, exactly. So, now, different cells turn over at different rates. You know you don't have the same cells today as what you've got 15 years ago. No. You know your body is essentially a new, completely new, uh, all the cells are essentially changed over. You've got some very long-lived ones up in the brain, but most of the cells in the body have turned over. Cells in the skin last maybe seven days or so, depending on the type. Cheek lasts about four days. Cells from the gut, lining of the gut, about two days. Uh, some of the blood cells, some of them last a couple of years. Some of them, particularly the red cells, last about four months. So we're turning our cells over all the time. Does that make sense? Yes. So when we turn them over, we've got to make new ones, right? Yes. If we're making new cells, if those new cells are exactly the same as the ones that, were, that we had previously, the, other, the first generation, if they look exactly the same, will we look exactly the same? Yes. We will. So if we've got exactly the same cellular information going into the next cells and they don't have any other damage attached to them, then that next generation of cells will look exactly the same as the ones that they came from. And so over time you wouldn't change, would you? So what's happening? Yeah, we're acute. Well, if, if they didn't change, we would live forever. But they are accumulating damage, aren't they, at each generation? How do you think they accumulate that damage? It's free radicals. Ultimately, the oxidative stress. That seems to be our best explanation. So, what actually is oxidative stress? Well, free radicals and oxidative stress. Let's see, reactive oxygen species. There's a few of them. I don't have time to go through it, but maybe the chemist will ask me later. When the reactive oxygen species, or free radicals, react with the body's tissues, they cause damage to cell proteins, lipids, membranes, particularly the DNA, which is that all that information in the middle, and we want to keep that healthy. And so what happens? Where do they come from? Well, the body's own metabolism produced most of them. But you can get it from sunlight, as I mentioned, chemical pollutants, domestic sprays, insecticides, car and factory exhaust. And of course, they'll come over and they start doing damage to different parts of the cell. Now, if you've got nothing <coughs> in the cell to protect it, then you will just get lots of damage. And unfortunately, that will end up in very rapid degeneration. Now, this is where it's gone from a, a PC to a Mac. I thank uh, Matt for changing some of my slides. And okay. Now we have this thing called antioxidants in the body. And uh, antioxidants, you would know a few of them. You know about vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C. So you mostly know about those sort of things. What well, you may not have heard of is things like polyphenols. Has anybody heard of polyphenols? Yeah. Okay, a few people have heard of polyphenols. And then you've probably not heard of these, glutathione, peroxidase, catalase, superoxide, bismutase, there's a few others. So this actually comes from where? Food, Food from the diet. These yeah. also come from the diet as well. Do you know where you get these ones? What types of foods come from? The dark coloured fruits and veggies. So as long as you've got the coloured ones, you know that between 10 and 100 times your antioxidant capacity, actually comes from these compared to these. So a lot of people will supplement with vitamin E and C and, and A. But uh, you can overdose, and I don't have time to go through on that. But making sure you get lots of dark coloured fruits and veggies is really important because in fact you get greater capacity, much greater uh, potential for antioxidant capacity from them. And then these are things that the body makes. I'll talk about a little bit later on when I talk about exercise. But actually exercise puts these up. So let's have a look and see if we've got our antioxidant capacity. This is where the body is trying to block the free radical damage. Ah, uh, Mac has done it to me. That actually worked. Uh, anyway, okay. <coughs> so what we've seen there essentially is that what the antioxidants will hopefully do is mop up any of the free radicals that are produced. Now normal metabolism will produce them. So you want them to be able to mop up. Now if your antioxidant capacity is up to scratch and you don't have too much uh, uh, free radicals going on, these essentially going to be in balance and you're going to be good. So, and also the body's able to repair some of these. So oxidative stress though occurs when the damage by the free radical is greater than the antioxidant capacity. In other words, you're producing more of these and your antioxidant capacity doesn't get very high. Now you can see straight away, if we stop the lecture here, you would already have some information. We know that the body's metabolism, I'll talk about it more, that actually produces lots of free radicals. But where, how can you increase your antioxidant capacity? There's two things that I've already mentioned. 
One is diet, diet particularly, <coughs> particularly the whole foods with the dark coloured fruits and veggies. More of those and you're doing well. And exercise, remember I said exercise actually puts up the particularly, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, okay, let me just show you that as we get older, and this is an important point, and, and this is some of the research we've, we've just published recently, but uh, I'll just summarise it very quickly. This is from somebody else showing that actually your free radical damage is increasing in white cells as you get older. We've had a look at it in red cells and shown that that, that actually goes up. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to notice was look at this young person here. While the rest of them, your free radical activity should be way down here, this person up here, probably around about the 27 mark, they've got a free radical you know, average of about the same as a, as a 60 year old. And then notice this. Here's these two people down here in their 70s who have got uh, a very low free radical background. So you don't all have to go like this. Now I've got other ones, I'm, I've just forgotten what I've actually put in here now. I've, the first time sake I've taken them out. But we just published a paper, in fact only just a couple of months ago, where we looked at actually DNA damage and looking at DNA damage as you get older. And we saw this inflection point again, and it just goes up markedly. Can we get a copy of that? Uh, you can find it on the um, internet if you have a look. If you just Google my name. But I'm happy if, if somebody wants to, if you give me your email to somebody, I can email the paper. It's a bit technical, but it'll, actually, it'll certainly show that, that increase. So after middle age, it tends to go up. So what that means is, is that uh, now you can speed up middle age, so if you're, if you're keen to get to middle age fast, then do a few of the things that I'll show you a little bit later on. But if you want to, uh, to slow it down, then uh, don't do it. And particularly once you've reached middle age, this is the time that you need to be very careful about uh, doing some of these things. Because and I don't think I have time to show you some of the, uh, the brain stuff. So Ross, these two people up there near the 80 there, are they just lucky, no, down the bottom, the really good looking oh, ones? Are they just lucky or have they actually made lifestyle choices that have led to that outcome? Yeah, we haven't followed that up. My prediction would be is that they've made lifestyle choices. Okay. Uh, but this is uh, some of the ongoing work that we need to do to really characterise that properly. Okay, so where do free radicals come from? How can you get more of them? Remember, if you want to age faster, this is the way to do it. And ageing is great. If you have a look at uh, some people as they get older, they've got nice characteristic lines in their face. And as somebody pointed out once, that uh, as you get older, you get the face you deserve. <laughs> and and that's, that's, that's fair enough. Um, so we'll show you how to, how to sculpture that, that beautiful age face. So cell metabolism, that's one of the best things, particularly the conversion of fats into energy. Now I'm going to preempt something here. If this is a great way of causing or producing more free radicals, does it make sense that the more of this you get in, the more free radicals you produce? Yes. It does. But anyway, I'll show you why in a minute. Then we've got anything that activates our immune system. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on, because the immune system works by actually using and producing lots of free radicals. Now, I'm happy to take questions as to some of the specifics later on, but essentially, we'll just summarise it that way. And then we can get it through our food. Has anybody heard of something called advanced glycation end products? Anybody? Advanced glycation end ages is, is the acronym. And I like it because ages age you. Uh, anyway, I'll explain more about it a little bit later on. But ages are great. And I'll show you one of the best places to get it from. So if you want to age, you get more ages. Ages actually come into the body. You can make them yourself. So having a high blood sugar and that sort of stuff will also... Uh, cause ages in the body, but you can eat them and they taste pretty good. Oh, well, you'll, you'll see. Uh, alcohol can also do it. I've got a little bit of work. One of my honor students is doing some work with alcohol. We're growing brain cells and having a look at it directly. Uh, I'll show you a little bit on that. And then the environment. Now, I think these are generally minor sources, unless you've got uh, some sort of exposure that are coming through from your, from your uh, uh, profession. Uh, so generally these are, are fairly low. But so it's mainly these that are going to be affecting most of us. <coughs> Let's have a first look at the first one. So the greatest source of free radicals come from the conversion of the calories we eat into the energy the cell needs. I know I generally need to call that kilojoules, um, but most people know calories over kilojoules. Now for those biochemists, you'll recognise that I've really uh, summarised probably about uh, uh, greater than 20 different reactions. But essentially what we've got is the sugars and fats that come in. We know we get some gluconeogenesis and things like that from amino acids. But let's just look at the sugars and fats. 
Now, we mix it with the oxygen. That's the main reason why you breathe. So the reason why you're taking breaths now is yes, the haemoglobin is picking it up and transporting it to the cells to do what? Exactly this. Now, you mix it with this molecule here, which incidentally is the foundation of a lot of our research, but uh, in any case, you mix it with this, been known for a long time, to produce the energy the body needs. Again, for those of you with a chemistry background, ATP. And then you produce this one. What's that? Carbon dioxide. What do you do with that? Breathe it out. Breathe it out, yep. And then the water, of course, the body can use it and use it to flush the body and a few other things. Now, it's interesting that this oxygen has got a... You know, certain electrons sort of get onto it that transports them and that sort of stuff. But as it's going through, there is a little bit of leakage. Not all the electrons are transferred the way they should be, and it's really quite, it's a beautifully elegant but complicated system. So I don't have time to sort of go into it, sadly. But you do get a little leakage of this one, which is called, does anybody know? Superoxide. So superoxide is one of the main free radicals that are produced. Now notice, if you push more of this in, what are you likely to get? More of this. And what's interesting here is that when you're young, you probably have about a 2% leakage rate. So about 2% of oxygen comes out of superoxide, and the body handles that pretty nicely. You know, as you get older, and people, once they, they get up past middle age and up into uh, the older age, you can leak as much as 10% superoxide. Sugar. It has to be sugar, white sugar, or sugar coming from fruit, dates, uh, bananas, this sort of stuff? This is really just the energy. So, so it can come from anywhere, but the key thing here is actually getting a spike. So the simpler the sugar, in other words, the simpler the, the uh, I'm going to call it a matrix, the simpler the matrix you take it in, if you just take in uh, lemonade, soft drink, uh, then of course you're going to get a nice spike, and there's nothing to dampen. So that's probably the most efficient way of doing it. But if you ease it in, then of course you'll ease it in over time. But yes, the more of this you have coming in, the more of this you produce. So that goes up, potential to do damage, particularly the DNA, and the problem with that is, of course, the damage that you do there, you pay for it in the next generation. Now one of the things here, and, and, and I'm almost going to put it up as a motto, is that in terms of our research, we're not here to tell people what to do. We're only just going to tell you the consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, you're all adults. It's entirely up to you what you want to do. And I remember giving uh, one of these lectures to some students. It was a nursing student, actually. And uh, after I'd given the first one of a series of four and some of this information, one of the students came down. She was, uh, she was not a small lady. But she, she sat in front, and she, she purposely brought out her chip packet, and she brought out a couple <laughs> of uh, biscuits. And, and you know, <laughs> you know and, and she was doing it. Others were twittering around her. So I had to stop the lecture, because I would have just ignored it. Cause Really, and, and as I pointed out to her, what she does to herself, ultimately she's doing to herself. It really doesn't affect me. It's, uh, you know, I'm here and my duty of care, not as a clinician but as a, as a research scientist, my duty of care is to give you accurate information. What you do with it is entirely over to you. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, now what's interesting, and it's the, probably the last time I'll mention, and that is this molecule here, NAD. Yes, it's needed up here, but it's also needed for two really important things that have only been found out in the last probably 15 years, certainly for the uh, DNA repair, but then another one called the longevity genes. I won't have time to go into it, but it is very exciting work. This is uh, a focus of some of our patents around this. But what you need NAD, when you tie NAD up like this, you tie it up as that molecule there, and you have a shift in what's called the NAD-NADH ratio. That has been long known to be associated with more degenerative uh, process. But people didn't really know why. Why was that? Well, now we know that if you tie it up as this, you don't have as much available for DNA repair, in other words, repairing the damage, and you don't have it available for what's called these longevity enzymes. Now, for those of you that want to look it up, it's called sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S, or silent information regulators. You can have a look at it. And in fact, the paper that we just published was mostly associa uh, associated with, yes, the oxidative damage, the free radical damage, but we showed, and we're the first paper in the world to show it, that actually NAD drops as you get older. Now, we happen to know that when you have a particular molecule out of the dark-coloured fruits and veggies, that your NAD actually goes up. And we can actually put your NAD up by about 40%. Now, we haven't demonstrated that you're going to, uh, you know, uh, turn an 80-year-old into a 20-year-old yet. Yeah? But, um, you know, there seems to be some good benefits to it. So uh, 
um, I think it's a good thing. So it's another sort of, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a negative spiral down. You do more free radicals, by produce more free radicals, more damage, but then you've got less available molecules that are necessary for repair and stress resistance. Okay, let me just show you uh, one of the studies that we're doing this year. Uh, this is a high-fat, high-sugar meal. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can guess. But it is high fat and high sugar, and it's pretty much not much else. High fat, high sugar, and water. And apparently it tastes very good. We don't have a problem getting people in to, uh, to volunteer for this one. <coughs> Even though we're taking blood off them, uh, you know, every, uh, well, half hour and then one hour over four hours. Uh, in fact, we've got a really good group of people who are volunteers from the community to come in, and they're doing sort of, we're doing this one, which is the, the whole food, fat and sugar together, and then we're taking that same group, two weeks later and they were feeding them just the sugar component, then we're feeding them just the fat component, and then we're actually comparing it to a whole food which is actually calorie matched. And you know avocados have uh, essentially the same calories as this particular high fat, high sugar meal? So very interesting. And then the last one we're going to do is a, a, again calorie matched, but it actually has high ages. You heard me mention ages before, I'll explain a little bit more shortly. But after just one meal, Within about, some people peak at an hour, some people peak at two hours, but uh, you get an increase of around about 35% on average. Some people go a lot more, some people are a little bit less, and that depends probably, we think, on their background antioxidant capacity. So this is an increase in blood oxidative damage. That's right, increase in, in blood oxidative damage. So essentially, if you want to increase your free radical damage, you do it, and you do it pretty much straight after your meal. And this is one of the key things. A lot of people think that, oh, okay, heart disease, it just means I can have a little bit of bad stuff every now and again, but, you know, I'll get heart, I'll, I'll, I won't get heart disease if I do it sort of in moderation. Well, we can show you that, in fact, to some extent in moderation, you are already putting the body under a challenge which will produce damage. Now, most people don't have problems damaging themselves at breakfast, you know, up in the morning, bacon and eggs and uh, coffee. And then morning tea, of course, they've got a muffin and, uh, and a Coke. And then lunchtime, you know, there's uh, you know, ham and eggs roll or whatever it is. And then afternoon tea, there's another one. And dinner, there's a nice big steak. And, you know. Well, look, um, of course, as a kosher meal, we, we, we wouldn't advocate uh, meat at all. And, and certainly probably lots of people in this audience wouldn't have ham. But uh, the population would certainly be having that. And so it's not hard for us to imagine that this is actually going on at every meal at every time. Now, I don't have the time to go and show you all the details about what's actually going on, which is a shame. But you see that you actually do inflammation within the blood vessel, which then, it's a little bit like you do a little bit of damage, you know, to your front lawn to begin with. And then, okay, it just needs a, sh you know, a shovel and a spade, you go out, fix it up, and away it goes. But you do damage, and then somebody else comes and drops some other rubbish on there, and more rubbish on there, and more rubbish on there. It's more than your spade and, and, uh, and wheelbarrow can handle. So you call a big truck in to come and get rid of it all, and of course the truck can get rid of all this rubbish that's going in, but it does damage on its own, doesn't it? And it comes in with all of its, uh, you know, as it tries to clear it off, and then eventually it's going to be uh, damaging your whole front lawn because you've got the big, big machinery. When you're doing damage like this, you've got to recruit the machinery, which is the body's immune system, which has to come in. Now it's not supposed to be there all the time. It's supposed to just come in, get rid of it, and then hopefully you don't need it again for another few weeks. Unfortunately, you need it at breakfast, you need it at morning tea, you need it at lunch, then you need afternoon tea, and then you need it at dinner, and then finishing off the nightcap, which a lot of people do with a bit of alcohol, which would be mm. unfortunate. Okay, this is just to show, this is another study that just shows very quickly how quick, uh, how much you can increase. This is inflammatory <coughs> markers. So this is actually the immune system being switched on and showing that you can do that very quickly. You get a 70 to 140% increase. Just in switching on the immune system, starting to recruit white blood cells there. Okay, now this thing called ages. If you have a look down here, you can see some pretty tasty food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I maintain that at some point, somebody's going to find something healthy about ages because they taste so good. So far, they haven't found any. Uh, but they are what's these advanced glycation end products. Major potential source of free radicals are due to these. As they come into the body, they cause reactions, stimulate the immune system, produce a lot of, pardon me, free radicals as a result. Produced by sugars reacting with amino groups in proteins, etc. Uh, age content of food is increased with cooking, and it can be ingested from the diet, as I've mentioned. So the more you fry something, generally speaking, the more ages you'll get. 
Now, I think the next one, oh yeah, and the high blood age is concentration linked to cardiovascular disease, dementia, and stroke because of the fact that it is increasing this inflammation. In fact, there are some uh, uh, drugs on the market at the moment that are being trialled in, in, uh, in phase uh, two trials for inhibiting the effect of ages to stop Alzheimer's. Okay, so where do they come from, or at least where do you get them from? And, and in terms of the foods, if you have a look at cheddar cheese, you've got about 1,657. You'll see some comparisons with the uh, uh, non-fried foods shortly. Uh, Parmesan cheese will give you uh, a nice amount. Uh, milk, small, just 12. Uh, wholemeal bread, again, not very much at all. That's pretty insignificant. If you toast it, 36. I'm happy with that because I quite like toasted. <laughs> so I figure I can handle 36 if I stay healthy. Um, fried eggs. You're getting up around the cheese. Uh, if you do an omelette, 27. And a poached egg is, uh, is better. Uh, yeah, it's, there's a few other things in there and the egg tends to get browner or crisper. Is this that causes pre red yeah, this will actually promote, so ages will promote ages lots of free radicals. Yeah. So the less you've got of these, the better. You pretty much want none. Uh, now, these ones, now this was actually in this publication, so I'm, uh, I'm doing nothing that's not already in the literature. So, Macca's fries is pretty good, but it, it gets better. Now, if you just take a boiled white potato, you've got 17, which is great. If we take a banana, that's nine, that's good. Dates is 18, carrots 10. So you can see that in terms of the, the fruit and veggies, it's pretty small, tomatoes 23. Now if you grill the veggies, uh, you know, you end up with a few more, but okay. Uh, if you decide to go the steak option, 6,674. That's not the highest one yet. There's our... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember having a chat, uh, uh, presenting at a conference a, a couple of years ago, and one of the other guys was presenting was a, was a general surgeon from um, uh, the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the main uh, sort of heart uh, clinics, it's a world famous uh, heart clinic in, in the US. But guess what they had on the bottom floor? McDonald's. Well, of course, the surgeons are happy with that because it just meant that the patients that are coming out are going to be right back in again. But, um, and, and it's absolutely true, which is why the turnaround is about five to, to seven years. Okay, and even a fillet, you know, is still around the 6,000 mark. So you can't really get away with it. So, really quite dramatic, and these will certainly make an impact. And this is actually the, the final group that we want to include as far as, as part of our study, because we have <coughs> all the calories the same, but we know that these will have a high advanced glycation end product. What is about... What about fish? Yeah, fish, in this particular publication, and I'm happy to send it through to people if they want to, um, and there's about 500 foods in there. Uh, and fish, if you fry the fish, yes, you're going to get a lot more. If you broil the fish, you get a lot less. So it really comes down to frying. And even frying in olive oil, you actually produce quite a lot. Uh, so frying seems to be the, uh, the big problem. Okay, and soy burger, there you go. Uh, only 30 for that. That's the US, we don't have the Bocca Burger, I'm not sure what we have here. And the Veggie Burger, again it was American, but 198. But we're significantly lower than this, and there's reasons for that, because there is high fat and high protein associated. Now, there's another um, uh, collaborator that we've worked with who actually did some work with Wagyu Beef, and you know Wagyu Beef actually has the, the marbling, it actually has a lot of fat in it. Uh, really puts up your inflammatory markers very, very quickly. Um, and I'm not advocating for a meat diet at all. I'm actually a, a, a close to a vegan. I'm, I'm black to over vegetarian. But um, it was interesting that he was comparing it to, to kangaroo. Now, that's non-kosher meat as well. But the kangaroo meat didn't put it up anywhere near the, uh, the Wagyu beef. Okay, now, just a little bit on alcohol. Um, this, is, uh, this is early days. This is one of uh, my honour students that's doing some work here. And we're just growing the brain cells. A lot of people haven't, you know, they take the brain out once somebody has died and they'll have a look at it from an alcoholic versus not. But what's fascinating is that this is within 10 minutes. We've actually shown, and, and this is probably, you know, probably a 20% increase in free radical damage we're seeing within 10 minutes, and that's at the blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. So 
very quickly. Now, I mentioned NAD before. Notice how quickly it drops. Now, notice that you needed NAD for energy, but you need it for DNA repair, and you need it also for the longevity enzymes. And I wish I had more time to tell you about the longevity enzyme. As a particular company that paid $720 million in 2007 for a patent around a molecule that stimulated the longevity enzyme. Those enzymes don't work without NAD, by the way. So if your NAD is dropping, they don't work regardless of how much you stimulate them. If your NAD goes up, they naturally increase. So it doesn't look to me, and this is the first time anybody's shown it, it doesn't look to me that it's a great idea when you can drop your NAD by 50%, even with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.05. Okay, some important points there. Uh, free radicals do damage to the cell, causing the body to become diseased and aging faster. Sources of these, high calorie intake, activation of the immune system, so we can use high fat, high sugar foods for doing that, and eating foods with high levels of age. So if you want to increase your free radical intake, this is the thing to do. I didn't make this up, and uh, in fact, I'm not even in charge of it. We're just uh, reporting it to you, we just found it. So it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or not. The fact is, it does happen. Um, increased free radicals from different sources can age some parts of the body faster. We talked about the skin already with sun. It's probably the main reason why liver and brain are, are affected by things like alcohol. <coughs> uh, lungs are certainly affected with cigarette smoke, but that also actually affects a number of other organs, including the blood vessel, uh, the arteries, etc. And the arteries, high sugars and high fat, we've shown already that this goes. Sorry, um, you know, you've got your good fats and bad fats? Yeah, there is studies to, to, to look at, and some of this has, you know, it hasn't really been separated as much as we would like. Um, we suspect that the polyunsaturates won't cause as much, so the things like the omega-3s and the omega-6s won't cause as much inflammatory response as what the saturated fats do, but, uh, you know, there's still work that needs to go on. But generally speaking, I think high fats are, are negative and of course high saturated fats is, is the word. And that, just the way it is, it actually comes from animal fats. <coughs> so it's, it's a good argument for uh, going vegetarian. All right, so if high calorie diets cause cell damage and faster aging, what happens if we reduce calories? Um, there's been a number of studies around since the 1930s and I, I haven't got time to tell you, but the first one was actually uh, done at Cornell University. One of the professors there looked at two groups of rats that were exactly the same, uh, they were litter mates. And so the same genetic background, but one group of animals, they reduced their, uh, their calories, same nutrient content, but reduced their calories by about uh, 20 to 30%. And they found that the animals that had the reduced calorie intake lived about half as long. So 50% longer than the other animals. So if their average age was, you know, 20 months, these would live 30 months. So it's pretty significant. Um, they've been wanting to do it in things like uh, humans for a long time, but humans live a long time. And it's pretty hard to sort of take one group and exactly control them for the whole of their lives. Because certainly if I took a young group, which is what I'd like to do, by the time you got old enough for me to check on it, unless I had done uh, some really magnificent things to my own health, I'm probably not going to be there uh, to test it. But what they did do is actually do it in a group of macaques, uh, now, I'm not a supporter of uh, uh, the close cousin theory, but um, macaques are a primate which uh, share probably closer uh, genetic similarities than what to uh, uh, mice. But in any case, this one was reported in 2009, so fairly recently. This is, uh, so these are exactly the same, uh, again, genetic background, but uh, they fed one group, uh, just allowed them to eat whenever they wanted, so ad libitum, and this other group, they worked out, they put them all together, they worked out for each individual how much it was going to eat over the course of about three months. And then they took, they halved that group and took one group and they reduced its calorie intake by 10% per month over three months. So 10% the first month, then another 10% the second month, and then another 10% the third month. So they were ultimately getting 30% less calories for their lives. And you can see they all live around about sort of uh, 30 So years which one's which? I'm, I'm confused. What yeah, so this is probably the easiest to see. So this is the... Oh, they're both the same age. Um, a and C is the same? A and B are the same. Oh, A and B are the same. C right? and D are the same. Oh, OK. Yeah. And if you have a look over here... So you can see that, uh, you know, he's... Uh, you know, 
teeth aren't so good, he's lost a lot of hair around his body, you know. Mm. Uh, this guy is still looking, uh, you know, still got colour to his coat, still looking relatively robust here. And if you come over here, just mortality, how quickly they die. So you can see that uh, this is the amount that was survival. So after about 32 years, we've got 50% surviving in the uh, control group. So 50% surviving in the ones that could eat whenever they liked. But we've got 80% surviving in the ones that were calorie restricted. So in other words, 50% have died out of the group that could eat whenever they liked, and only 20% have died in the group that had calorie restriction. Is that eat the same thing? Exactly the same. Exactly the same. So there was no... If we wanted to improve on that, then we would give one a much more nutritious diet than the other. But no, they ate exactly the same, but 20% less calories. So the same nutrient value, but 20% less calories. And if you have a look, it's even worse when it comes to the types of diseases. So in terms of the number of animals, that's the percentage of animals without disease. So for the ones that could eat whenever they liked, only 20% didn't have disease after about 32 years. Whereas 70% were disease-free in these very old animals if they reduced the calories. Has that made sense? Mm -hmm. So it's pretty important. You can see calories alone. Now, if you go back to that slide that I showed you about how you can produce more superoxide, the more calories you've got coming in, it sort of starts to make sense, doesn't it? And its impact on NAD and that sort of stuff. So the more calories you've got coming in, the more free radicals you're going to produce. Now, for everybody here, it's not that difficult to drop your calorie intake by 10%. How many people had Mars bars today? No, oh, OK. Nobody's admitting. Maybe you didn't have any. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm only joking. Um, yeah, look, the, the important thing is that if you reduced even just you know, the Mars bar in the day or the dessert at night, you're getting close to that 10%. It doesn't take much to reduce it. And every time you do, pat yourself on the back because you've actually done yourself, you've given your body a little bit of opportunity to repair whatever damage it needed to pick <coughs> up from the day before or the meal before. So every time you do drop back, <coughs> you're doing a good thing. Okay, you might be craving and you might be just desperate for it again in another hour's time or so. But know that for the time that you didn't do it, you've done yourself a good turn. Does that make sense? Because the damage is happening at the time. All right, so eating less calories reduces free radical production, slows the ageing process, and reduces risk of, of uh, diseases. I know, I'm going through it fairly quickly. So we've talked about uh, antioxidants already, and we know that these things come from exercise. So I've talked about glutathione, catalase, and there's a number of others, um, whereas the others come from the diet. Now, I just like this one. It's um, exercise making uh, childhood obesity fun. But... Um, in any case, this is a true picture, Japan. Um, it does a number of things, exercise. And you don't really need that much. We don't have a lot of time. But uh, 30 minutes a day, and you can in fact do it in 10 minute increments, what's called interval training. That will work. But you need to do it so that your actual, and I think the best way to tell is whether or not your heart rate goes up and your face is hot. So as long as you're doing it at that level, now, if there are any medical conditions or you're feeling faint, make sure you go and have a, a check-up first before you actually get stuck into it. It's always a sensible rider. But there's a number of things that it does do. It does reduce the stress response. I haven't put it up here, but chronic anxiety stress, which all of us are in, and I travel more traffic coming from there this way is what it was when I used to have to travel every day across to Randwick and back. Um, and it's a bit of a pain. And then looking for a car park, I felt stressed before getting here. Mm. Now, what the best thing is, if I want to reset that before going home and having a big meal, because a lot of people will just go home and have a nice big fatty meal, or most of the community would actually go home and have a bit of a tipple, a bit of alcohol as well, mm. both of them will actually reduce your feelings of stress. Unfortunately, you also get a lot of negatives when you do both of those. Mm. When you exercise, Yes, it's true, for the first five or ten minutes, you're just not going to feel like doing it at all. But you get a lot of benefits afterwards, and you also get that little endorphin kick. You actually increase muscle activity. There's a number of things. It reduces that... Now, when I say the stress response, that's called a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, if anybody wants to know. But it resets that, which enables you to be able to relax and sleep. If you do the other things, it doesn't. All right? So you don't get the benefit. Um, so it does reduce the stress response, reduces the desire for food, that's absolutely true. 
gives a little endorphin high, you do get a little kick, if you do it so that your face is hot. All right? So you've got to do it that much. Now, it promotes mitochondrial activity and fat and muscle cells. What that means is, you know, it's good when you see some of your friends who can eat anything because they've got a fast metabolism. And some people actually drink caffeine in order to do that. Yes, caffeine does increase your metabolic activity, but unfortunately also stimulates your stress response. So it's a negative, unfortunately. But when you exercise, you actually increase your basal metabolic rate. So you do burn off. You can, in fact, not that you're trying to eat more calories, but uh, you can, in fact, burn them off easier. And I really think that we shouldn't be worried so much about BMI, but we should be, um, we should be more interested in uh, uh, being healthy. And the BMI will take care of itself. So that's the body mass index? Body mass index, yeah. Okay, so it increases that I've mentioned, uh, and yeah, improves a few other things. And it also increases the activity of the antioxidant enzymes, which are the things that you want to protect yourself against free radical damage. So you get a lot of benefits. Try and put it in. All right, so eating food with the right nutrients will also help here, and I've talked about these before in the flavonoid polyphenol class. Just a couple of things, again, for time. Uh, evidence suggests there's fruits high in concentrations of these flavonoid things. Just think of it as the dark-coloured things uh, in things like pomegranates, purple grapes, berries. I've mentioned those before. Uh, reducing cardiovascular risk, they're antihypertensive, in inhibit platelet aggregation, increase endothelial dependent vasodilation. Okay, one of the quick things here, and I'll just mention that last one. What we do know is, when your free radical activity goes up, your blood vessels become stiffer. Is that a good thing? No. When you have heart disease, your blood vessels get stiff, right? And so your blood pressure goes up, which puts more stress on the blood vessel itself and can do more damage to it. What happens is that the body, when you have, you know, the heart pumps and you get that nice big ventricular contraction, out goes this big bolus of blood, which is hopefully going to get to the rest of the body, pumps out, the blood vessels relax. That's called flow-mediated dilation. They relax, and they relax as a result of, funnily enough, a free radical called nitric oxide. Now, that's a good thing. The body produces it, needs it to relax it. If you're producing more free radicals in your diet, the way that you know, I've shown you how to do, it will actually react with that nitric oxide and cause a very toxic free radical, but in addition to that, it stops the nitric oxide from being able to relax the blood vessel. So your blood pressure straight away goes up. So, and that happens again after the meal. So you will be more hypertensive, you will do more damage. So, uh, okay. Now this one here, dark chocolate, blood pressure and cholesterol lowering effects of dark chocolate consumption are beneficial in the prevention of cardiovascular events in a, popular, uh, in a population with metabolic syndrome. This was published recently, that's 2012, this was 2010. Lots of talk around chocolate. And uh, there's a, a friend of mine who wrote a book about chocolate, some of you may know. But uh, in any case, I have always disagreed. And I still disagree, but for the vast majority of chocolates. Now, I like chocolates, um, which is why I don't buy them. In <laughs> fact, uh, and it's very, very true. At Christmas time, uh, you know, occasionally, or if I'm doing a talk somewhere, often I'll be given a box of chocolates or something as a result of the end. I don't tell the people who are giving them to me, but, but I take them and I put them in the bin. I know, and I get that gasp from people you know, as soon as they hear that. And <clears throat> no disrespect to the people who are giving it to me, but I know that if I had opened that chocolate box, I would eat everything. Because I try and eat one, and my wife would go, that's it. I go, that's true, that's it, that's enough. And then I go, but why not have just another one? So, you know, for people like me, a bit obsessive compulsive, I'll, I'll uh, need to put it away. But those chocolates aren't good for me. If I wanted to get these benefits, you know what sort of chocolates you're eating? The ones that don't taste good. The ones, if it doesn't taste bitter, it's not good for you. So if you want to take this on, and I'm just giving you the facts, I'm not making up the rules. Um, if you want to use this and you want to reduce your, uh, you know, your blood pressure and all of that sort of stuff, then, yep, if you enjoy a bit of chocolate, okay, you might get some of those benefits. Now there's things like theobromine and a few other things in there which might do other things as well. But uh, yes, that sort of thing does happen and you do get the benefits. They are actually full of quite a lot of um, polyphenols. Okay, so I know it's a whirlwind tour, but what else can we do to live longer, healthier lives and slow the degenerative process? Exercise and eat more nutrient-rich food. If you take anything away, that's the key thing. Less calories, it's going to work. 
And every time you have less, every time you can say no, and I've said this to people before, you know, apart from having chocolates, which I don't have, but uh, the other thing is I really enjoy my favourite food is actually a, a jam donut. And, uh, you know, every time you go into Coles, there's, uh, you know, Wendy's there with the jam donuts. And you know what I tell myself? I say, I can have a jam donut whenever I like. Mm -hmm. But I know that when I do, I've got a pretty good idea what's happening when, when I take it in. So I try and work out, you know, is today the day I could handle that amount of damage? No, probably not. All right, I can have it tomorrow then. And then I'll see, you know, and if I've had a good sleep and exercise, maybe I've, I've had about one jam donut now in, in, well, I did have the first one this year, um, probably about uh, two months ago. So, Ross, when you say, well, if we're already having a nutrient-rich diet, you're saying we can eat more of that? If you're, at, if you're genuinely eating a whole food, nutrient-rich diet, as long as you don't go heavy on things like the pastas and things like that, then it is hard, it, well, anybody can overeat. So overeating even the good things is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, your calories are going to be reduced. But a lot of people, and it's particularly true, and, and because we're talking uh, uh, you know, within the context, I guess, of Adventist health, uh, this is what I find amongst people who are vegetarian, and unfortunately particularly Adventist vegetarian, is they replace nutrient-rich foods with a lot of the pasta foods, and sadly, still seeing things like cheese and <coughs> stuff. And it's not good for you. Um, so yeah, a little bit, of course but uh, generally speaking, not lots. Yeah? I'm um, just wondering, uh, when you were saying there to avoid high sugar, and sugar is in a lot of things, um, including like you know, the good food as well. So how much of um, sugar intake should we really have, and how do we know that we're eating too much sugar? Yeah, I think if you are still getting it as a whole food, uh, you know, as long as there is a, uh, there, there is, and I think I get this right from the Japanese, but it's, it's basically called harihachibu, which basically says that you eat until you're about 70% full. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do that with good food, you're not going to make a mistake. It's hard to really overeat, even in calories, at least in my opinion, uh, with good food. When we were looking at calorie matching for uh, our high sugar, high fat, simple food, which you can buy in you know, nice frozen dessert tubs, um, we were looking at doing it, first of all, with um, something like uh, uh, grapes. But we would have had to eat so much grapes that you wouldn't have actually got it into people, which is why we ultimately chose avocado, which is actually much more energy dense. Uh, but I think if you take that, you know, and you don't want to stuff yourself at any rate, I think if you take that principle, then that would be a, a, a good thing to live by. Okay, so health from the English word. Now let me just talk broadly about this kind of thing called holistic health. So I had to talk about um, you know, sort of the nutrition side on one hand, and then I, I want to bring it together in terms of holistic health. So the word health actually comes from the English word hail, meaning wholeness, uh, a being whole, sound, or well. Um, there's a popular use of the word holistic health, which is spelt with an H, not a W. Uh, it's... Um, it, interestingly, it actually came from a guy called Jan Smuts, uh, who was a South African uh, um, politician who was uh, responsible for lots in apartheid. But uh, how that got to the note, I'm not sure. But in any case, when we have a look at the body, most people think of the body, okay, depending on how they, uh, they look at it. Uh, they can think, okay, that's all there is. But the mind is intimately related and intimately connected. <coughs> if we chop ourselves off from here, uh, how long do we think for? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much not long. Um, and it is very important. You need the body to support the mind. I'll ask, and I know that this is a, a, uh, a, 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 a Christian-oriented audience, how does God interact with you? Mind. Interacts with you through the mind. And in fact, what's interesting is really the frontal cortex, which is where you actually make that decision-making. That's your moral decision-making centre. Now, God needs to be able to interact with you through that aspect. Is it possible that what you're doing down here can affect what's happening here? Do you think so? In fact, uh, we don't have to go very far from here. Uh, and what you would find is that there are people uh, spending quite a lot of money on affecting particularly their frontal cortex. How will they be doing that? Alcohol. You go down, have a few beers, a bit of wine. It's certainly going to affect this very, very quickly. In fact, 
uh, one of the first thing it affects is frontal cortex. And uh, uh, caffeine affects a slightly different part of the brain. But, uh, it actually kills brain cells. Yeah, well, we've actually shown that uh, certainly when you're, you're culturing it within about 10 minutes. So it actually happens right. very, very quickly. So it is something that you need to be careful of. But before it does that, in fact, it inhibits parts of the brain which are necessary for actually thinking. So if you're doing that, and if God communicates with you through that part, then clearly that's not ideal if your ambition actually is to get to know God better or be clearer in your relationship with God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can certainly do that by other things as well. Now, it also, the emotions which are driven from up here, down here, but there are ways in which you can actually cause, affect your body, which changes the way you feel emotionally. I don't have to go through a lot of this. You'll be able to think about it, and, uh, and of course, that all makes sense. So, we have a spiritual which provides, and I like to look at it as, as sort of a, a, a principled context in which we place a lot of our, the way we feel, the way we act, and ultimately the way we communicate with God, which has to happen through the mind. This can be affected by what we're eating, certainly can be affected by the way we treat our body in terms of our lifestyle. Now, Pastor Kevin already talked about uh, the Daniel diet, so you're aware of this. Now, as somebody mentioned uh, once, in fact, it was uh, my, my older sister who said to me, you know, the Daniel experiment is uh, is got to be one of the uh, um, most famous, but uh, probably least controlled of all experiments. There was only three of them in it, and they only did it for 10 days. Um, they took three years afterwards. But anyway, they seem to have uh, got some pretty good results uh, as a result of going whole food. Now, <clears throat> while what's actually happened in there is, as, has been expanded and there are, there are lots of uh, diets associated with this. It was essentially one which went no alcohol and it went vegetable based. There's some great evidence to suggest that this really, for the reasons that I've pointed out, uh, that they're all obviously getting lots of the polyphenols, they're getting, I didn't talk about the gut, but very important to actually have the right kind of bacteria in the gut in order to maintain health. And the more we find out about that, the better. The other interesting thing is that it seems that the gut needs to get into a fasted state in order to retain a level of health. Now, there are some conditions where you may have to take multiple meals over a period of time. But for the vast majority of the population, having at least, and ideally six hours, but at least four hours between the meals, allowing the gut to get into a fasted state is... There's good evidence to suggest that that's the healthiest way of doing it. So snacking is not a good idea. So when you say fasted, you're saying having, having meals well spaced. That's right. You're not, you're not talking about having a like 24 hour or 48 fast, or you're talking about both. Well, <coughs> the benefits if, if you have you know breakfast at six and then lunch at 12 and then you know dinner at six, that's pretty good. Uh, there are benefits uh, from people who and people who try and go on sort of calorie reduced diets, and there are people who are being experimented on and experimenting with themselves by doing that. And they will fast regularly by missing a meal. Uh, not generally missing a whole day, mm -hmm. but missing a meal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm going to touch on a, a, a spiritual aspect which suggests, and this feeds into what we consider is to the, the Adventist health message. But when you think that man was actually created whole, he was, wasn't he? Yes. He was created and his mm -hmm. connection with God was there. He was socially, worked beautifully with uh, you know, it was his, his partner, and he was physically and mentally well. He was 100%. When sin came in, there was a significant change in what happened. He was certainly spiritually unwell. He was disconnected from God, correct? He was also socially unwell. It didn't take long before that there was uh, you know, the first murderer, which is really the, first, uh, the, the second generation. And he was also physically and mentally unwell. He certainly started to degenerate. And as a result of that died. Now, admittedly, uh, inspiration suggests that he lived for quite a long time. But he did ultimately die. And, of course, we seem to be dying fairly efficiently uh, in much younger ages from now. Uh, and, in fact, just very quickly on that, in terms of uh, degeneration, uh, there's a fellow by the name of John Sanford who uh, published a book uh, relatively recently uh, he was a geneticist from Cornell looking at population genetics and looking at uh, whether or not uh, the 
gene pool was big enough to ideally increase because of you know, a, a postulated evolutionary progress. And unfortunately what he found was that, uh, he and his colleagues actually found that the, uh, the gene pool was accumulating genetic mistakes at such a rate that it alarmed them to the fact that uh, it looks like the human race will not live too many more generations. But in any case, we are certainly degenerating. Now God wanted to restore man back to wholeness. He wanted to restore him back to wellness. So he did a number of things. In the Old Testament, God uh, would himself pay for our sins, and he gave that by type, so that was the sanctuary service. God provided directions for good relationships, and you get that through the Old Testament, through uh, Proverbs. Uh, particularly Proverbs, but also a number of good laws through the Leviticus, etc. <coughs> and God also gave direction in relation to physical health. It's one of the very few um, uh, ancient groups who actually looked at things like hygiene. A lot of other things spiritualize their aspects, whether or not it's vegetarianism or whatever it is. Even their washing is spiritualized. God's spiritual aspect of here was, you know, be holy because I am holy. But it was all associated with maintaining hygiene, making sure there wasn't communication of those diseases that could be communicated, and maintaining a diet which was free of, uh, and generally, particularly for the Israelites uh, throughout their, uh, their desert time coming out of Egypt, certainly was uh, retained on a vegetarian diet. So that was very important, and in fact, the New Testament, of course, God continued these. He showed that the type, meaning anti-type, Christ died on the cross. Moral law was retained, and of course, Matthew 5 spells that out beautifully. And the Old Testament principles on diet and hygiene, when practiced in the New Testament by Christ and others, maintain, of course, you've got a healthy population. What's interesting here, though, is uh, restoring man to wholeness, that's great, this is in Old Testament times, or at least in Biblical times, Old and New Testament. Spiritual wellness, social wellness, and physical wellness, <coughs> God was restoring. Now, he's still interested in that for us too, is that correct? Mm -hmm. If we have a look at the modern times, what's he doing? Well, we still have this, spiritual wellness. God's sacrifice is still there. We've got clear understanding in relation to his responsibility within the sanctuary service, and that's terrific. Social wellness, God's moral law, is still the best foundation, actually, for where, how we interact with each other and our connection with God. There is no question it is the best way in terms of setting up the ethics for a community. Now, physical wellness, main health issues in the time of the Bible, because they were agrarian communities, were things like undernutrition, infectious uh, and, and communicable diseases. They didn't have to worry so much about uh, exercise because any time they wanted to do something, they had to exercise. They didn't have to worry so much about uh, you know, pastas and McDonald's because everything was whole food. It was coming from the, you know, right. Yeah. that's right. Um, but what are the main issues for us? Industrialised, urban communities, we've got lifestyle diseases. This is the main thing that kills us. And it's really the way we live, which is lack of exercise and lack of nutritious food, by and large. That is what's killing us, there's no question. So my question is, if physical wellness is part of God's restoration <coughs> plan, bringing man back to wholeness, and it has to be because God wants us to be able to communicate with him. And in order to communicate best, we need to have the brain working well. I remember going, uh, and I was in Melbourne, and I had to learn this uh, technique, and there, there was a group at, at, at Melbourne Uni that were doing it, and uh, we were just cutting out uh, a particular part of the brain. So it was a surgical technique. And I needed to learn some things beforehand. Now, this is quite a few years ago. Um, while I was uh, still generally interested in the healthy aspects, there were some things that had sort of you know, lapsed in terms of my practice. And I was really hungry, so I popped just down the road and got myself a fillet. And uh, came back, and to be really honest, for the next, and I just remember this very clearly, because I didn't regularly have them, but this was an emergency food, as I know most of you might treat it. And uh, it took me at least half an hour, probably longer than that, probably an hour, before I could really start thinking again and clearly following the concepts that I had done previously. And I reread that paper, and I just remember it clearly about three times. There is no question that what we do to ourselves will affect the clarity of our thought. And while uh, you know, we might have picked it, I might have picked it up there, there are other times where you need that clarity and God just can't get through because of the way you, know, you currently are. He can get through much better if you're healthier and clear. So the question is, though, did God take any of this into consideration? Gave great laws in relation to the Old Testament. What about modern times? What about modern times? 
Well, let me show you this graph. This is actually deaths due to cardiovascular disease, which I say is an indicator of lifestyle diseases. Fair enough? So this is the deaths due to cardiovascular disease from 1900 to 2007. Now notice, <coughs> this was published last year in the uh, American Heart Association Journal Circulation. And uh, notice that they really start picking up just after 1900, reached a peak in terms of the number of deaths per population of uh, you know, around about the 1980s. And you can see what's actually happened here is not that people have got healthier, just medical science is able to keep you alive a lot longer. <coughs> And so, uh, you know, we pop in stents and, you know, the surgeon can take, uh, you know, veins out of the legs and, you know, give you bypasses and all sorts of stuff. We can keep you alive. But unfortunately, it's very expensive. And also, you're going to end up going back to them probably in about five to ten years' time. So, Ross, if you have a graph um, that would, develop, would uh, illustrate the, set, the developing world now, because I suspect that we're going to see the similar sort of thing happening now. Exactly the same. In fact, uh, mm. and this is uh, there's been re some recent programs on uh, uh, on um, the ABC in relation to the increase in obesity, particularly in developing nations, places like Brazil, China, um, uh, India. Uh, absolutely, because manufacturing and let's be clear, the industrialized <coughs> industrialization of food has produced what we call food security. None of us probably go home thinking, oh, where will I get my next food from? It's all there, and it's there in abundance. We can keep ourselves alive. Now, that's gone all around the world, and so it is available now in a lot of those <coughs> countries because they have begun to develop, and they've developed an infrastructure. But unfortunately, what's happened is that without industrialization, we do two things. We transport calories more efficiently than we transport whole foods. And unfortunately, the whole foods, this package of stuff, and I'm sad I don't have time to go into some more of that because it's absolutely fascinating. This package of stuff, which involves not only the vitamins and minerals and things that you know we need, but a whole lot of other things that seem to interact in really exciting ways which we <laughs> never imagined before. So really, if I can stress anything, get more whole foods. And <coughs> honestly, every time I look at this and, and I'm just inspired, I go home and I make sure that we have you know, lots of colours somewhere in the, in the place. Okay, but this, this is fascinating. So notice that this is actually where we're going in terms of the problems with society. So lifestyle diseases is taking up, really taking off after about 1900. Notice what happened about 1900. Does anybody know who Ellen White is? Yes. A few people know? Obviously, Ellen White, there was a level of inspiration, uh, and I think uh, Ellen White was inspired, but it was interesting. She published a book in 1905 called Ministry of Healing. And uh, lots of things contained in that, in that book. It was interesting, just had uh, a, a couple of months ago, I was interviewed on, um, uh, for the, uh, yeah, it was, it was uh, the Encounter Program on um, the ABC. Just in relation to uh, um, uh, different views on spirituality and health, and they wanted to get uh, the sort of Adventist view, because Adventists have had an interest in health for essentially its inception. This was probably the clearest uh, uh, presentation and the most complete work that came out from there. But it was unique for its time. But what I'm fascinated with is not only was it unique for its time, it was spot on time. Mm. When we talk about what was needed to prevent the population from going this way, it is exactly the thing that were published in this book. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness. Now I know you're going to go through a number of these so I don't have to go through them. I talked briefly about things like exercise and I talked about diet, but all of these other things make a huge impact and certainly the relationship with God is very important in terms of our psychological well-being. But I was just blown away, when, and like I said, this was only published last year, and to have a look at that and then realise when were inspiration was actually God was interested to have a people who were going to be able to get themselves off this kind of thing. So there shouldn't be and there's been studies that have done now, particularly in the US in the Californian Adventists, showing that they live you know, up to a decade longer, particularly for men, uh, you know, if they follow uh, this sort of lifestyle. But also not succumbing to a lot of the lifestyle disease that are there. But we really, really should have a population amongst the Adventist population that goes across here, or for everybody who wants to follow this particular diet. And I remember saying it to the, the producer when he was interviewing me, and I was explaining some of those statistics. And we had a great chat afterwards. And he says, oh, you've almost persuaded me, or, you know, yeah, almost persuaded you make, make Adventism sound very uh, um, um, 
attractive, very attractive. Uh, and I said to him, not so much Adventism. I'm not interested in you being necessarily part of the club, but I'm knowing Jesus. And of course, he gave us this message. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Spot on time for just the right reason. So I think probably the best thing for me to do is leave it there. Ross, if, um, if we were to follow those lifestyle practices, Mm. and we were therefore right at the bottom of the graph in terms of death due to cardiovascular disease, yep. we still have to recognise we are mortal. What are we going to die from? Yeah, what is interesting... Lifestyle disease. Yeah, what is interesting is... Uh, and, and people that are working in our area... Now, I don't, <coughs> I don't like to classify our research as, as ageing research because we're really interested in degenerative processes. Now, it just so happens that ageing is part of that, but you can certainly create the degenerative processes at any time in life. Um, there are people who think that you can uh, keep the human living forever. I don't think so. I think there's two things that happen. We have what I think is programmed senescence. So there is a programmed lifespan. But I think it's not unreasonable to think that that probably is out to about 120 years. The thing is that a lot of us are working very hard to make that as short as possible. <laughs> And so we race to try, and I, I said to an audience, which was at an average age, a lot older than this one, and I said, you know, essentially we're all in the anteroom of eternity, and we're all there waiting for our turn, we're standing in line, but there are definitely some people that are doing their best to push in way ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've explained how you can do it, uh, but hopefully all of us want to go the opposite way. Uh, the one thing that you haven't mentioned <coughs> is uh, preserved food. Some of us are European and Eastern European, and we eat things like sauerkraut and pickled cabbage, uh, olives and brine, uh, cucumbers, pickled cucumbers. Yeah. The, the preserving process can do some things. It can create things like ages. It can actually produce some things that are not good for you. But of course, when you have very long winters, it's far better to have food that's preserved and keeps you alive than not. And there's still a lot of good things that are in a lot of those preserved foods. The other very important thing that comes from the more traditional treatment of foods is the soaking that goes on and the actual preparedness that comes as a result of uh, not taking things that are straight off the shelf. That's a whole new area. Uh, I'm not an expert in that, but certainly a lot of the uh, uh, phytates and things like that which can themselves prevent the absorption of some of the things which would have gotten rid of by soaking and things like that the traditional way of preparing them is good. Um, Ross, perhaps I could just add a little bit to that. I lived in the Pacific Islands for a year, and uh, I think the point I would say is that we need to uh, make use of the best possible diet that's available Correct. to us. You know, if you're an Eskimo living in northern Canada, you know, yeah. you're going to have to make avail, you know, use what's available to you. Correct. In the islands, I mean, fish is going to be a very, very integral part of your diet. If you're living in a climate like uh, this friend was up just saying, you know, you, you know pickling and preserving foods sure. is going to be essential. That's going to be the healthiest long winters. Yes. My wife's Korean. Same there. You have to be able to preserve foods throughout the winter time. Yeah. So you do your best with what's available. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really good good principle. Now, as it turns out, we've got a pretty good food supply here, um, but there are some groups that, because of financial constraints or whatever, uh, they have uh, less availability and. and I just find it, uh, and it'd be nice to see some things changed in terms of our, uh, our legislation. Since we're in the law faculty, maybe we can encourage uh, some people to uh, uh, do that on, on, on that behalf. But essentially, it seems that as soon as you find something is healthy, uh, people want to put the price up by two and three times. And that takes it out of the reach of people. So some of those things, not wanting to get into that side of stuff, but yes. I just wanted to clarify, what do you actually research? What we're looking at is particularly the cause of degenerative changes, that cause yeah, of oxidative. Um, might be a good question for afterwards. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just in interested, like, what are you actually doing and how are you doing it? Because, you know, it's not really clear to me. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not looking for a big, you know, conversation with it. Yeah. Just simply. Okay. I'm happy to chat with you. Essentially what we show, and I'm just very briefly, so you can see that as far as producing the things like heart disease or dementia or even cancer, a lot of that is associated with what we call oxidative stress or free radical damage. What we're essentially doing is looking to see what foods, if you like, are the best cause of increasing free radical damage. So you're studying foods. Well, we're studying a number of things. You're studying 
We, we are doing a number Mainly of things. Or how food is made or processed or what? So Ross, could you say as an example, the experiment of using ice cream, let's face it, that was the product you were talking about, what impact it has in the very short term, the half an hour, the, the hour after it was consumed, what impact did that have on the, the blood samples you did? That's take? right, that we, right? That's, right. That's, that's what we looked at in that case. I mean, when you're asking the broader question, what to research, I mean, our whole series of studies that we've been doing previously was actually looking at the oxidative process, which didn't involve foods at all. I know, I was just so hoping you could simplify it, you know? Could you simplify it? Yeah, so essentially the ones, the studies that are important for what I was talking about tonight mm -hmm. is essentially to say free radical damage produces a heart disease, etc. And part of our studies is actually look and see which foods will actually produce most of that free radical damage. And what it seems to be is that if it's high fat and high sugar, they seem to be a great way of producing more free radicals, therefore more risk of disease, which is bad. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about decaffeinated? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of, of uh, caffeinated uh, foods. There is roasting that oh, happens. He's asking decaffeinated. Yeah, I know. Mm, uh, so there is, there is things that happen as a result of the roasting. So potentially decaffeination, uh, because it's still in the roasted product, <coughs> can have things that are uh, associated. I mean, it's got lots of advanced glycation end products. So the agent, it still has that advantage. What about olive oil? Is that good or bad? I remember being at a uh, at a conference. This is a nutrition conference uh, a couple of years ago and uh, all the uh, benefits of omega-3 were being extolled. And then uh, the presenter, of course, which was an eminent uh, international speaker, says, of course, most of these benefits you can also get from olive oil. Uh, generally speaking, olive oil has been considered, particularly with its link to Mediterranean diets and its link to reduced cardiovascular disease, is to be thought of as very good. What is interesting, though, within olive oil, and we use it quite a lot, but what is interesting is that they also can potentially produce, particularly if you fry with it, can produce lots of these ages or advanced glycation in the um, So <coughs> it has a, a fairly low uh, heat point. But <coughs> you've got splash it on your, splash on your yeah. salad raw, <coughs> don't cook it at that, so it would be better to yeah. use it. And, and I need to be cautious and declare my, my ignorance in, in some of these areas. I mean, we haven't specifically looked at it, uh, so it's only really just what's coming through in the literature, but I, I would, uh, like most things, I mean, if, if you can boil your fruit, and, uh, not your fruit necessarily, but you boil your veggies, steam it, uh, these are the best ways as opposed to... Do you to recommend a high-heat oil? Caltex, no, I'll do For different reasons, different oils are, are good. Uh, canola is still an okay oil. Um, but... Uh, you know, there's arguments of whether or not it's, it's uh, you know, from uh, genetically modified and, and not. But, uh, um, you know, by and large, broadly speaking, less frying is the best. Yeah, I think what Ross has said earlier was that he doesn't want to get into pres prescribing the detail. He wants us to think about it on a principle base and apply it. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of literature that you can find. Unfortunately, it's hard to know which ones are right and which ones are wrong when you actually read them on the internet. Well, this is only night one, and we have some other presenters who's going to give some more detail. So they may Did have you direct us to certain literatures? <clears throat> but, you know, do you know which ones are right and wrong? Yeah, look, the... Um, the in, in Ministry of Healing would be pretty good. Ministry of Healing very good in terms of principles mm -hmm. again. But, um, yeah, I mean, the Dietitians of Australia, if you have a look at their vegetarian interest group, uh, that's, that's particularly good. They can give you some, some good information there. Mm. Now, I'm not sure how time is going, but... Yeah, we really need to wrap up. So okay. maybe just one more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this is a common one that comes up in relation to acid and alkaline. And we haven't done any specifically. Uh, there's no question that you can change uh, the, the uh, pH of the urine as a result of what type of foods that you take in. So if you're taking in a high protein diet, then of course the body's got to be able to get rid of those amino acids and metabolize them. Uh, and when it does that, a number of amino acids there will produce uh, ammonium, which is then converted to ammonia. You've got a free proton, which then the body needs to excrete. Now, the negative side of that, generally speaking, is that the pH of the urine drops, and as a result of that, it's harder for the urine to retain things like calcium and things like that. Your pH, the body keeps the, you know, the pH right. It doesn't, it's not your pH in your blood that's changing, but it is the, the way the body has to handle the extra uh, uh, protons, and so they've got to get rid of it. So not doing that is probably great. Sorry, Ross.